Some of you motherfuckers have some damn audacity, all right? Listen, in the previous video, some of you were like, ooh, Kai's losing his shit. He's losing his marble. He's talking to the voices in his head. Why is he schizophrenic? Listen. First off, if you have schizophrenia, I hope you get treated for that. It's not a terrible thing if you have it. Mental illnesses affect everybody differently, okay? They're not a bad thing to have. Second off, how fucking dare you, all right? Let me be clear. I'm not schizophrenic. I'm Japanese. So here we are once again inside of a dish soap VOD. Now I know the last video was about dish soap. I'm, I'm aware. But listen, dude, this guy's fucking killing it. He's not only did, was he the first to hit Masters, he's already hit GM. He's now sitting at 250 LP at the time of recording this video. We gotta watch how this guy plays, man. Like, what? Like, okay, he's like the Magnus Carlsen of TFT right now. He's just killing it. Absolutely decimating the competition. So, uh, like, we have to watch and see what Rank 1 is doing, see if there's anything that we can learn. And in this one in particular, I think there's gonna be some really interesting stuff to talk about near the end game that I think a lot of players are struggling with during this set. But obviously, we'll talk about that when we get there. 2 1, or, sorry, 1 2. Right off the bat, we are inside of the Dreaming Pool inside of Ionia. For those of you who don't know about this realm, this realm, at the start of every stage, you gain a champion that fits onto your board. So, how do we play around this realm? Well, there are a couple key takeaways we need to talk about. In Dreaming Pool in particular, the way that the game decides what units fit on your board is based off your active traits. Um, it may be based off of the inactive ones too, but from what I understand, it's based off your active traits and it works very, very similar to hero augment mechanics back in set 8. And the way that you would tailor your board is that you would try to keep the active traits of whatever unit that you'd actually want on your board. That way, once the beginning of the next stage happens, you get that unit that you want. Here, he has three challenger on his board, so it's very likely he gets a challenger, and it might be possible for him to get that last unit that he needs in order to fit four challenger onto his board. In this case, it's the Samira, and he'll be really set with a very, very strong opener. For our augments, I should probably talk about this a little bit. It's pretty clear that it's just combat caster. Um, I didn't actually see what he rerolled here. We can just rewind it a little bit, but I mean, metabolic and parting gifts, I mean... Come on, it's always combat caster here, right? It's, it's pretty clearly combat caster. We take this every time. You could take Zon Crest if you wanted to. Currently, though, as much as I love Zon, and I am a huge Zon stan, uh, it's just not that strong at the moment. It needs a little bit of buffing. It requires a lot of finesse. It needs a lot of high rolling, at least right now. So trying to hit that Zon Crest holder early game, really hard to play around. Maybe around 42, Zon Crest stats might actually be better. Um, if you end up playing around Zon and then you just play Zon Crest and then you play around like a really strong Zon carry like Kaisa or Yasuo, but that's only after if they buff it right now, it's just a little too clunky and difficult to play around. So unfortunately, Zon Crest is just not an option here. It's always going to be combat caster. We could take three's company as well if we wanted to, but we do have three challenger. We're already looking to play for a win streak. So combat caster, a combat augment is the way to go. And so we'll be taking combat caster here. And again, dreaming pool. We might be getting that fourth challenger on our board. So... Who knows? Also, it is a Samira though, so maybe it's just in our shop. So we'll see what happens here. But again, once again, it's always Combat Caster. So Combat Caster here, Dreaming Pool proc. We get the double Warwick here. And so we are going to be playing double Warwick plus Viego 2 on our board because that's going to be our strongest board with the Callista as well that we got from one of our orbs. So here, unfortunately, GS isn't the best of slams. Actually, funny enough, I think personally I would have slammed IE in this scenario, but I guess Dish Soap's read is that IE is maybe not as good. And also, to be fair, uh, Callista is an AP unit, so that also might be one of the reasons. But actually, that probably is the reason. You probably wouldn't slam IE now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know what the fuck I'm smoking. But moving on. Again, we still missed on the fourth challenger here, and now it's getting a little difficult, a little more difficult to play around, if you will. But we do hit the Jin 2, and we're able to play around the Ionia instead, flex off of challengers, and immediately switch into the Ionia and potentially play around Dead Eyes in this scenario. Really, really great. Unfortunately, this GS Slam makes a little less sense now because IE would have been better in this scenario now, for sure. It is what it is. We're, we were playing our strongest board, and it was very unlikely for us to just like pivot so quickly, like the way the, like the way that we did. We bought four units from our shop from that round, for God's sake. Anyways, moving on. Warwick two, really, really great. This is a very, very strong Ionia Gen opener. It's one of the strongest, actually. So if you're ever trying to play into Ionia Challenger, this is like one of the best or even ionia dead eye it's actually becoming a bit more prominent nowadays with the ionia crest slam onto the aphelios but you also don't really need it you can just play two dead eye with Jin and aphelios totally fine board it's not i, I think it's less consistent than the yasuo and kaisa in my opinion but still fine to play nonetheless none but here we go moving to the carousel and actually we're gonna speed up through stage two because 
I mean, I guess we can talk about, you know, level, level 5 and, like, what we're going to play around here. But, I mean, it's very clearly Deadeye, right? So, going to quickly fast forward here. Picks up the chain. Yada, yada, yada. It's just the best thing that you can take here. And, you know, this is one of those scenarios, again, let's look at our board real quick. What do, what do we take onto our board here, right? Because, like, clearly our board, nothing fits, right? So, what unit would you pick up from your shop here? which would make the most sense, and you throw it on your board even though the traits don't match. Take a second, think about it. What unit would be the best to throw on here, right? Now, if you ever play chess, actually, this is a cool, this is a cool metaphor, and this is not a shitty metaphor. Um, if you ever play chess, you know that in chess, you need to think about your checks, your captures, and something else. There's three things that you need to keep in mind. I'm not a very strong chess player. This metaphor is already falling apart, but you get the idea. In TFT though, we have similar options here. If we don't know what unit to attack onto our board, think about your active traits first, and then you think about the cost of the unit, and then think about the utility that it provides. And these three, it's not necessarily in that order, but you can think about those three and try to balance between them because there's a bit of finessing that goes on TFT. It's not straightforward, right? Um, also, by the way, that, that chess thing, if, if you know the three, let me know. It's, it's checks, captures, and something else. Anyways, first off, let's talk about the costs, right? We have Rek'Sai, Darius, and Garen available to us right now in our shops, right? Three cost-wise, out of these three, you could probably pick up whatever. Like, honestly, you could probably just pick up whatever, right? And there's nothing in here that screams like, oh, it's technically a bit stronger than the other out of the threes, right? So let's move down the costs now. Let's think about the two costs, the Vi, right? What we were talking about earlier. Cost of the unit, but also the utility that it may provide. And out of all these units, Vi actually provides Armor Shred. So even though Vi is a slightly weaker unit in terms of cost, she does provide a bit more utility with the Armor Shred, and that actually is probably the correct choice here in order to spike our board the hardest, even though, yes, the traits don't align. And as we will see here, Dish Soap, please don't fail me, yep, plays the Vi for the Armor Shred. I actually, it's so funny because... I'm just like critically thinking about it and I'm hoping that he just makes the right decision because I actually didn't write in my notes whether or not he played the Vi in this spot, but good. I mean, he's ring one for a reason, right? Awesome. I mean, maybe he just picks up something else and his read is that one of those units is just overpowered, but I mean, and that, there's no way, right? There's no way. Anyways, moving on. And again, we're going to speed through all of the rest of stage two because again, there's not much really else to talk about. If we hit that, uh, or whatchamacallit, if we hit... The Deadeye, we would play it in this spot, but again, we don't. But we do pick up a Zed, which is another Ionia unit. But again, Zed doesn't really benefit too much out of the Ionia. He's actually one of the worst Ionia units, unless you're playing him for a reroll comp. So we are keeping this Vi on our board for the Armor Sunder. Going into the Krugs now, what's our game plan, right? We're playing around Jin. Maybe we play around Yasuo. Maybe we play around Kai'Sa. Very straightforward. You might even go like, damn, this is kind of like the last video, right? And to that, I say suck my ass. Because quite honestly, it's not... It, I mean, okay, it... it it, okay, look, it's kind of similar, okay? It's kind of similar. Also, by the way, just real quick, notice how he tailored his traits again. He tailored his traits for the beginning of this uh, set. We're going to move past what I, whatever we just talked about. Listen, it's not the same, okay? It's slightly different, and it's very different for at the very end. But we'll talk about it later, okay? Anyways, he tailored his traits again. Why? Because there's a chance that he rolls potentially a four-cost challenger like Kaiser Yasuo, which would fit really, really well into this comp here, right? In Ionia, in this realm, actually, I forgot to mention this, playing into verticals is really nice. You just get... Free high tier units within your vertical tree that you're playing around. Good shit. And if you're trying to pivot, make sure that your active traits are the active traits that you actually want for whatever carry that you want. For example, if you're trying to play around Azir, you probably want that Sharima, maybe even Strategist, right, on your board. That way you can get those things online. You get those high cost units. You might be getting like that Akshan, but maybe you get that Azir later on. You know? Who knows? I don't know if the cost of the units is like the same across the board like if you always will get a three cost at three one i think you probably do um i've played in this realm a couple, handful of times but i don't have it in my notes so if somebody could let me know in the comments that would be pretty fucking pog moving on three two young wild and free pandora's bench late game specialist we are clearly re-rolling like pandora's late game specialist but what about young wild and free young wild and free is really interesting this augment is really nice and really awkward for a couple of reasons. It's really nice because if you're wind streaking, it's very difficult to get the components that you're looking for. So you might want to take it if you're wind streaking because that way you're able to grab whatever components that you need off carousel and not worry too much about it. The problem though is that if you are wind streaking, you aren't deriving power out of your silver augment. So in that regard, it might not be as good. 
And as we can see with Dish Soap, uh, if we just scroll back a little bit here, he's on a four win streak here, right? So we really want to make sure that we try to play for our win streak here. So even if some of you are thinking like, oh yeah, Young Wild and Free is like a really nice augment, like we definitely should be playing it, right? Even if we look at the stats, some of you might be going, oh, the, the stats are crazy on it, right? Like if we just look, right, Young Wild and Free, it's averaging a four point, it averages, it's really poor at 2-1 by the way, but it's really good at four point, at 3-2. It's averaging a 4.14, it's really, really nice. So stats wise, it's actually really nice here. And if we low roll on the Lakey and Specialist and the Pandora's rerolls, then it's very acceptable to be taking it in this spot, even if it isn't the best choice that we are given, right? But as we're seeing here, we're giving Unified Resistance and Indomitable Will. Indomitable Will, I just don't think it's a very good augment in general. It requires a bit of finesse to be able to work really well with into it. Also, the stats don't really like it on top of the fact that like you need that takedown in order to get CC immunity, but usually that CC immunity is what enables you to get takedowns. So it's... You know, not sure if it's that really that good. Unified Resistance, though, really strong augment, really, really great. Gives your whole team a buff because we're playing it at level 6 here, right? Really, really solid. Um, Also, it's a combat augment. So actually, Young, Wild, and Free, we'd probably want to reroll here and probably think about playing Unified Resistance here. And here we're giving Healing Orbs instead as an option. Now, you could argue that this is a stats angle. Because what I mean by stats angle, it's like, hey, you have two very good options here. At this point, just pick which one's better based off the stats. But there's actually a correct option between the two. It's the, like between healing orbs and unified resistance, you actually have a really good, you have a like a significantly better choice, right? Let's just talk about the stats real quick because they're very comparable, they're very close. Healing orbs at 3 2, the great version 4.27, really solid, but unified is at 3.97. Okay, so stats wise, unified resistance is just looking a lot better, right? But let's think critically too. Like, if we had no stats, what would we do in the spot? Like, do we still pick up? Unified resistance over healing orbs just because the stats say so, right? Well, let's think about it, right? Do we need the healing? Do we need the healing? What's our next in? Think about it, right? Our next in is probably going to be a challenger unit. It's probably the Samir that's on our bench at the moment. That means that out of all of our frontline units, we have the Aurelia and we have the Set and the Warwick 2, right? The Warwick 2 is the big one can provide a lot of utility for having a lot of HP and just tank infinite if we get healing orbs. But the problem is, is that our frontline is weak as shit. Really weak. We are going to probably roll a little bit on six here, right? For sure. Maybe look for the set two. Maybe look for an Aurelia two, right? Maybe even look for the Samira two or even a Callista two, right? Our rolls are very efficient here at level six. But our frontline right now objectively is weak. So we do need to fortify it, and out of everything, we already have a lot of HP, we're lacking resistances. So Healing Orb, while it may seem great in this scenario, Unified Resistance is better because we're able to fortify our frontline significantly more through more value because, again, we already have HP. HP is more effective when we have resistances to add and stack on top of it, right? So that's why in this spot, Unified Resistance is better. And again, stats would have told you that as well, but... Again, it's important to think critically about this scenario because let's say our Warwick had like, like uh, I don't know, a fucking Bramble and Declaw. Much better to be taking Healing Orb in this scenario, actually. It would actually be like really, really good. Um, I don't know if it's much better, but it's definitely better. Uh, but yes. So here, unfortunately, though, we do not roll very much here uh, because we ran out of time. But also on top of that, we're actually kind of poor. Uh, I do believe we may have level to 6 at 3-1 instead of 3-2, and that's because we wanted to preserve our streak. I don't remember, but it's... That is probably the case here. And as we can see here, unfortunately, we do lose our streak. And you can see here that, like, he doesn't even break down under 30. Um, usually on stage 3, too, by the way, I'm going to actually keep the video playing in the background because the stage 3 is not too important in this game. But ideal scenarios, you don't want to break under 30. Technically, 32 on 3, 2. 32 is because even if you lose your streak, you will make 40. So 32 is sort of the golden number. And... You see he's holding like a lot of one cost on his bench, so he definitely has at least 32. But he's probably his read is probably that like, oh my boy's probably strong enough that I can still be able to streak. Uh but again, rolling on six here was probably also a correct call. And don't be afraid to roll down to 20 if you have to, if you think you're gonna bleed out and you're losing in the early game. Here, I think it's a bit of a mistake for him to not roll, and it also took him a little too long to figure out his augment choices. But again, to be fair, the healing orb versus the unified resistances, it's a bit of a difficult decision to make on the fly. So you could have done like oh just stats angle, but at the end of the day. Thinking about it critically is important, especially because it's good practice for when we don't have stats available to us anymore within a month's time. Which, by the way, uh, again, fuck that shit. I'm not happy about it. But 
moving on, right? So again, we're going to talk a little more about stage three, but again, I'm going to fast forward through stage three because there's not much to talk about. Obviously, because of our gold and our lack of a streak now, leveling to seven is going to happen for sure at 4-1. If Dish Soap did win that 3-2 round though, we definitely could have considered leveling to seven at 3-5 instead at playing even higher tempo and trying to roll there. Right, looking for maybe a couple of four costs that we might want to play around, like the Yasuo or the Kaisa. But you know, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say because we don't know the exact number of money he would have had. He would have had maybe around like fifty ish, and like like 50, no, probably like sixty ish, right? Sixty ish with the streak. So maybe he would have had a bit of a better chance to try to roll down on three five with the leftover money they would have had if he were to level. So here four one, obviously we're gonna level to seven here. We hit the Kaisa through the Challenger, right? Again, our traits are tailored because we're trying to hit those four cost challenges we're looking for, right? Obviously, we're hitting either the Kaisa or the Yasuo here because we're probably going to be hitting 4 costs on stage 4 from the Dreaming Pool. And now we can start doing our roll down at level 7 at 4 1. So, here we're looking for Kaisas. We're looking for Challenger units. We're trying to play 6 Challenger. That's the easiest way to play onto our board. We could potentially try to sneak into a 6 Ionia instead. But because we rolled the Kaisa instead of the Yasuo, it actually makes way more sense for us to try to play around Challengers instead because that was the first Challenger we hit. We're way more. Like, if we miss Yasuo, it's very possible. So. Potentially hitting the, not hitting the Ionia units is a very real situation here where we hit all of them except for the Yasuo and then we're just in a really bad spot, right? But here, we hit the six challengers. Really, really nice. We do roll down really low though. As you can see, we're sitting on a Urgot and a Warwick. I'm sorry, I keep pausing it sporadically. I don't know why. I, I have like a point I want to make and then I just don't have it. But I have a point I want to make here at 4-2, right? Talk about the augments here. Adrenaline Rush, Infusion, and Mana Burn. We're not playing Juggernauts. Very obviously to skip over the Adrenaline or the Adrenaline Rush here. Very obvious to skip over Infusion as well. Infusion, like, it can be good. It's one of those augments that's like, it's hard to feel the effects of. But also, we don't really care about our units casting too much. Plus, we we're playing Challenger. They're going to cast a lot anyways. We don't really need Infusion, right? There might be some sort of synergy with Infusion and the fact that we have so much attack speed on our board that we're just garnering so much infinite mana that we're casting all the time. I kind of doubt that's the case, though. Um, Kai'Sa's mana pool is really high. So I, I kind of doubt that's, that really matters, but she's the only unit we really, really care about casting. Maybe Yasuo, but Yasuo dies very quickly. Uh, so Mana Burn is sort of the only option here, and we're probably going to reroll the first two on the left and on the middle. And actually, we can probably reroll the last two because we hit Gets from the Fallen way better than Mana Burn, right? So Gets from the Fallen or Jewel Lotus here. Now, just based off these two, you might think it's Jewel Lotus 2, but actually Jewel Lotus 2 has been underperformed pretty hard in the stats. So we're going to be taking Gets from the Fallen here. Again, if we think about it critically here, though, um, it just makes more sense to take Gifts from the Fallen here. The only two units that are really benefiting from Jewel Lotus are Gasso and Kaisa. So if we're only benefiting two units anyways, we might as well benefit just one Hyper Carry and just throw all those stats onto either Kaisa or Yasuo, and in this case, probably your Kaisa, and Gifts from the Fallen makes more sense, and we definitely take it in this spot. Now, here we are at 4-2. Now, stage 4, this is where things are interesting. It, it deviates a little from the previous video. Why does it deviate so much from the previous video, right? Let's talk about it. In the previous video, for those of you who don't remember, because it was two days ago and you have short-term memory loss, right? <laughs> Stop smoking weed, by the way. That shit, that's terrible for you. Uh, okay, that's not true. I shouldn't say that. I mean, okay, it depends on the person. Sorry, we're getting sidetracked. Listen, for those of you who don't remember, whether or not you have memory loss, right? Maybe I have memory loss. I don't fucking know. Listen, we're getting sidetracked again. Sorry. Sorry. Let's talk about our board, okay? I'm going to pause the video here because I'm clearly there's too much stimulus going on here, okay? So let's think about it, right? Here, our new shop, we're at 39, H, 39 gold, right? 4-3, level 7. What are the two potential scenarios that we have available to us, right? We can either go level 8, try to go level 8, and roll for our units. Or we can stay level 7 and try to roll for our units, right? And you might be going like... Roll at seven. Why the fuck would we roll at seven? Right? Who are we looking for when we look at our board, right? We're looking for that Kaisa 2. We're looking for the Yasuo 2. We're looking for the Irelia 2. Those are the only upgrades we're looking for, right? So why would we ever roll at seven? Well, let's think about this objectively, right? If we push level eight, yes, our four cost odds are higher. It spikes from 15% to 25%, which is nice. It's a nice bonus. But I, you're, there are two things to keep in mind here, though, right? The first one is that we need something that we want to put onto our board at level 8 to justify going level 8, right? Level 8 is not all about the shop odds. It's also about finding units that we want to take onto our board. 
who do we tech onto our board here at level eight, right? Let's think about it. We right now in the shop, we hit the Yasuo pair and we hit another Warwick, which we probably shouldn't be making. I don't know why he's holding this Warwick here, but what unit do we th throw in at level eight? We have Shadow Isles available. We have Dawn available. Our Zon, by the way, the chem mod, was not very good. I believe it was Exoskeleton. No, it wasn't even Exoskeleton. I think it was, like, the exploding one. I forget the name of it. Not very good. Not very useful in this scenario. So we're not playing Zon. Also, there's no Zon unit that you really want on our board. And Shadow Isles, it's like it's really only Senna. Even then, Senna only benefits... Benefits the whole team. But that's just... She'll always benefit the whole team. So... There's not really a good unit to put on our board at level 8, right? Besides a legendary, maybe Heimerdinger. Very expensive, though. So what are we going to do here? What are we going to do here, right? We're going to start rolling here. Rolling. We just hit 50 Econ. Why aren't we slow rolling, right? Doesn't this seem like a bit of a like, wasted opportunity here? Aren't our rolls pretty inefficient here? No. That's actually not. So here we hit the Yasuo 2. You might be going, oh, well, he's just a dirty high roll. He just happened to find the Yasuo 2 here. He wouldn't have found Yasuo 2 here if he didn't decide to roll in this spot. And a lot of players would actually decide not to roll in this spot. The reason why he rolls here is because he understands that his level 8 is shit. Nothing good to tech onto our board. Senna is the only good option. And it's not even guaranteed we're going to hit the Senna. So clearly, we have to be rolling on 7. Because our cap for our board with 6 Challenger is at level 7. Now, you could argue he should also be holding the Callistus for a potential Callista 3, and that's actually a fair point to make. And in fact, you can even argue that's a bit of a it's a bit of a misjudgment to be holding the Warwick's here when we're not even looking for the Warwick 3, and we've skipped over upgrading them. We've already decided that it's not worth our time, right? So what are we rolling for at 7? We're rolling for should be rolling for actually the Callistus. I think it's okay to hold them in this scenario. Um, it's clearly unitemized, and we need to itemize Yasuo next. So you could argue that it's not okay, and quite honestly, after talking it out, it's probably not okay to hold the Callistas. But don't hold the Warwicks either if you're Greaves or Econ, right? We're ro rolling for the Kaisas, obviously, but we're also rolling for the Shen 2 to take off our set. And you might be thinking, like, hey, like if we take off our set, we lose the Juggernaut buff, right? Well, Juggernaut doesn't fucking matter, right? And in fact, as we see again, we are we are tailoring our board here again. Now, this is the part where Dash Stove actually does make a misplay here. He tailors his board here, which is great. But in this set in particular, which you may have forgotten, there is no 5 cost challenger in this set. And we are probably getting a 5 cost on stage 5 from the Dreaming Pool. So this is actually a mistake. And what he does, what he fails to realize is that we are going to hit the Senna no matter what. From the Dreaming Pool. Because we have nothing but challengers and Shadow Isles, we're getting Senna. So what he should have done here, instead of rolling in this spot, is that he could have actually tried to push level 8 in like a round or two. And then start rolling then for the other Kaisa, for the other Shen too, because he already has his level 8 unit that he can take into on his board. Here, he decides to roll here at 7 though, because he, I think for him, he thinks that his board is just too weak at this point. So without the Kaisa 2, it's very unlikely for him to be able to stabilize and he'll start drastically losing HP here, right? And so you can argue this may be a mistake or may not be, right? This is a tough decision to make. You could go level 8 here if you thought about the Dream Pool thinking, okay, I'm going to hit the center no matter what, right? But even with that being said, though, it is very true that, like, if you push level 8 in this spot or you push it within, like, a turn or two because it's a little expensive, right? It costs 46 gold and we're sitting at, like, roughly about 50. It might be a little too expensive and we're not guaranteed to hit that Kaisa 2, right? So our cap may actually just cap out a Kaisa 2 here. It's a very difficult judgment to make. So what I'm trying to say is, Unlike the last video where we hit 8, like, not too difficultly, right? Because we took Tiny Titans in the last video, right? In this video, we just decided to send it down all the way down at 7 to try to hit this Kaiser 2, try to hit the Shen 2. Don't be afraid to cap out at level 7 in this set. If you realize your level 8 board is only just slightly that much better, and there's really not that much merit to it, it's okay to cap out at 7. But be smart about it. You might have noticed he didn't like just start immediately rolling at 7 and just zeroing out every single time donkey rolling. That's not the, not the way to do it, right? Push the limit. See where you can go with it, right? Can I eco enough to maybe go level 8 and then roll, right? He pushed it, he ecoed up to 50, found the Yasuo pair, and went, okay, now it's more efficient for me to roll, right? Think about your rolling efficiency. How many units are you looking for when you're rolling for it? Does it make sense to be rolling for these units at a level? 
right? And for him, again, he's not rolling for just that Yasuo 2 earlier. He was rolling for also the Kaisa pairs. He's also rolling for potential Shens, right? It's a lot of forecasts to be looking for. And the odds are, again, level 7 versus level 8, the odds are not that much worse. They're all right, right? What you need to understand, though, is that, again, if we decide to cap out at 7, though, don't expect to win out the game. Don't expect to win out the game. Um, maybe if you're playing around, like, a 3-cost three 3-star, three right? And then you, like... Like Jugger, like I don't know, like Juggernaut Garen, and you're hitting like the that, or maybe Noxus reroll, or maybe even Echo reroll, and you're trying to cap out at seven, right? Sure, fine, because you're hitting like infinite three stars, sure. But if you're playing like a vertical, or not a vertical even, but if you're playing just like a standard board, I mean, we are playing into a vertical in this scenario though. If you decide to cap out at seven, don't expect to win out the game. Once Dish Soap rolled at five, was it five one? And he decided that I'm going to roll down and try to hit the Kaisa 2, try to hit the Shen 2, right? He said in his head, I'm not playing for first. I am playing for top 4. And if he goes top 4 in this game, that is a dub. So as we can see here, because he was able to identify that, he's basically secured his top 4 spot, and we're able to chill here, okay? The first or 8th play would have probably been to play for level 8 and then roll down afterwards. But we also have to keep in mind the tempo of the lobby and how strong people's boards are just in general, right? Solus here, he's level 9 here with an Aphelios 2 and just a very strong board in general, right? I mean, our Yasuo's doing Yasuo things, so it was like it's actually pretty close. We actually win, which is kind of crazy here, right? We shouldn't be winning in this spot. But Solus is basically going to try to win out or at least like secure a really, really strong board to win out at least his top 4. His HP is just too low for him to win out. It's really unlikely. But... Again, we decided that, hey, we're going to try to get a top four, and that is still a dub. Like, don't be dissatisfied with top fours. Going fourth, going third, that's still a win, okay? Totally fine if you have to decide that, hey, this game, the best I can do is a third. There are going to be games, by the way, where if you're playing the game long enough, you'll start to recognize, like, hey, I can't even top four this game. So mitigating your losses is a really, really important thing to keep in mind whenever you're playing TFT. Because there are going to be some games where you genuinely do low roll. It's not often. And the lower elo you are, the less likely that is to happen, actually. So, fun fact. We'll talk about it a different time. But keep it in mind that, like, you have to know when to cut your losses. And just say, hey, if I can't even top 4 this game, can I try to top 6? Right? Sometimes you'll hear streamers go, I'm playing for 6th, I'm playing for 7th. Right? Because they recognize that, hey, this game, it's fucked. Maybe I played the early game wrong. Maybe I made a really poor financial decision during the mid-game. It's okay. It happens. But if it does happen, make sure that you just take it as fact. Understand that, hey, I fucked up in the early game or I fucked up in the mid-game. How do we recover? Right? And don't think about, don't think about it as in, like, how do we recover into a fourth? Baby steps. How do we recover this terrible eighth into a seventh? Can we make it turn into a 6th? Maybe we can turn that 6th into a 5th now, or maybe even a 4th, right? Move up and think about these things, right? And it, it, that is an important skill to have. You'll notice a lot of top players don't go 8th. It's rare for top players to go 8th. It's usually a 7th at the worst. Diminishing your losses and cutting them when you need to is an important skill if you really want to climb. This is true across all sets. And it's especially true in this set as well. As we'll see here, there's Soap. He's basically cemented his fourth. He's basically cemented his third place here. Solus unfortunately doesn't end up winning out here. He doesn't get his fourth place, even though he was capped out at nine. Um, you could argue Fast Nine is very, very greedy, and I would agree with you. But here, as we can see, he's playing into like a very, very strong Sork board. He does manage to hit the Senna two here at level eight, which is very, very lucky considering that one of the Senna's was from, in fact, the Dream Pool and another from the Carousel, and he's actually able to win here. So it's very possible for him to actually even top two in this lobby, even though, again, we didn't make what, well, it's not that we didn't make a poor financial decision, but rather it was a financial decision that was hard to see. And whether the right answer was chosen or not, it's, it's a bit ambiguous, but as we can see here, I mean, sure, confirmation bias, but it doesn't end up being the correct choice. So as you can see here, if he gets lucky, Kurum will kill Protect Soul Scroll or whatever. Just a lot harder than their soul will lose to Kurum's Ghost. But unfortunately, that just isn't the case. Kurum actually ends up losing to the Mage Guy and their soul goes third. So I hope you guys learned something in this video and happy climbing.